Hello from wherever you are, and welcome to Let's Play Games. I'm John McFarland, Adult Services Librarian for National Public Libraries, and I hope you'll join me in learning or rediscovering some of the more common and uncommon games out there. This time, we're going to go a bit more niche. You're probably familiar with how to play various card games, but you may not be familiar with how card games have developed over the centuries. So this time, we're going to discover one of the most commonly played card games of the 17th and 18th centuries, Whist. Let's get stuck in. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with the deck of cards, I want to take the time to go over this just so we're on the same page. A standard deck of cards is going to be in four suits, in a spade, a diamond, uh, what we call a club, and hearts. And each suit has cards from ace, so that's our representation of one, all the way through ten, and then what we call the court cards, jack, queen, and king. And depending on the game, the ace can either be the low card or the high card past the king, and sometimes both. So as a reminder, we're going to do one of the most important things that you do with any deck of cards, shuffle it. And for those of you who may be unfamiliar with how to shuffle, let's show you real quick. What you're going to do is you're going to split in half, you're going to hold up Put a little tension on the card, not too much. See how it bends here? And then slowly with your thumbs, let go of a couple cards at a time. You should see that little flickering there, and it'll be this nice little butterfly effect, and then you'll just combine them together. It takes a second, but it starts to mix the cards and does it a couple at a time. So before you play any game, before you play any round, make sure you always shuffle. Otherwise, the game can get kind of boring. You can also, since that is kind of a learned skill, you can space it around and do it like this. Um, you can do uh, this note. It takes a second because you got to make sure all of the cards are flat. You can also just do it like this, where you hold it partially on one side, and then put a couple here, put a couple here, put a couple here. So, now that we've got that, we've got to look into how to deal, how to sit, and where to go from here. So, whist can technically be played with as few as two and as many as seven players. We'll get to that later. But, for this first time, I'm going to show you the four-player version of whist. You'll agree to a partner, so I'm going to label it here player one, player two, player three, player four. One and three are going to be on a team together, two and four are going to be on a team together. Player one, their job is to deal out the cards like so. They start on their right and move clockwise, so it'll be one, it'll end up being a total of 13 cards. And it moves fairly quickly once you've gotten experienced at dealing, but take the time since I'm having to reach around. Um, more often than not, it's usually considered good form in this game to not look at your cards at all until it's dealed so everybody can do it at the same time, but that's generally a house rule, as it were. Now, this last card here is actually going to be the most important one. You're going to actually turn it face up to where the other players can see it. So I talked about the four suits with the spades, clubs, hearts, and diamonds. With whist, what's important is the suit. So as we begin to play this game, I'll go into more detail here in a moment, keep in mind the spades. It's going to be our trump suit. So the player will be able to put it back in so yes, everyone does know that the Four of Spades is what they have, and what we're going to do is start organizing it. Uh, you won't be showing the cards, I'm going to show it to make it easier for you to see, and let's put them in 
suit order here, and I'll clean it up a little here in a moment. So we may fast forward a little bit here just to get everything set up. So give me just a moment and we'll get everything ready to go. Made it a little easier, everything's all set up. So everyone here has 13 cards. In a normal game, you would not see anyone else's cards, especially your teammates. One of the strategic elements of this game is that you're working together as a team, but you don't know what your partner has. So seeing what's played is gonna be very important as well as figuring out whether you want to play a good card or a bad card, depending on whatever your teammate has played. So the way that we do this, the person who is first is going to put a card out. The goal of this is to put out a card that will win by playing the high card in a particular suit. Whoever the dealer is will go first, followed by it rotating around so everyone has an opportunity to lead the hand. People are able to play a high card at their leisure, so they're looking to play if you have a king, if you have a queen, if you have a jack, if you have an ace. Ace is the high card in a suit. If you wanna almost guarantee that you win the hand, you play that card, except for the trump suit. Here's where things get interesting. So we put spades out, spade is our trump suit. If you don't have anything to play in that suit, so first you've got to go through what you have on suit. You must play that. If you don't, you are allowed to play a spade. If you play a spade, it doesn't matter what the card is. If you're the only spade on the field, you win. You can play a two of spades. If you're the only spade, you've got it. So what we're gonna do is for this time, I'm going to lead with, uh, let's do the five of spades first, uh, just so I can demonstrate as a concept. Uh, now, this person has to lead with something else. They have the ace, so they could win, but maybe they don't wanna play it that quickly. So they'll play the nine. So as it stands right now, player two, representing the second team, would be the one that wins the hand. So it goes back to player A. They have a suit to play, so they must play it. So now player three on the first team is in line to win the hand. So now over here, you have the option to play either a lower or a higher to try and win. Let's say that they decide to pull out their king. The king of spades has been played, which means that player four is the one that takes what we call the trick. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna combine all of these up together and place it over here, face down, with player four. Now, what happens is it moves. So now we're gonna go over to, let's say they wanna start off by getting rid of a low card, they can play whatever suit they want. Now, people have to follow. Six of diamonds is the only one that player three has, so they're gonna play it. Uh, this person is on team B. They see that this person has played a low card. They can try and win it depending on what they have. The king is here. If this person doesn't have a diamond to play, then they would be able to play a spade and win the hand. So. It's making a decision there. But what's gonna happen here, we're gonna play that low card and just get rid of it. So now that we know there are only higher cards, at least a minimum of the four of diamonds out there. So part of this game, which is why it's usually ended up playing in quiet, is because people are trying to see what cards have been played, what cards are left, as that makes an important decision. And we see here, they have to play a diamond, so they're gonna play the lowest card they have. Why? Because now they've got in reserve the jack and the queen. They only had to play the lowest card in order to win. 
So play continues like that around and around. But I'm sure you're probably interested in how this game got developed over time. Let's get into that a moment. So I'm sure you're wondering, why am I covering a very niche game from the 16th century? Well, it's the basis for a lot of our modern card games. The first reference we saw to this was actually in England around the 16th century, where it was actually known as Trump, uh, later Ruff, later Ruff and Honors, with the first description of it in 1674 in the Complete Gamester. But before the game was actually put down as a rule set, we actually see a reference in the year 1529 by a preacher who was referring to the game of Trump and specifically said, the game that we play shall be at the triumph. Now turn up your Trump and cast your Trump, your heart on this. And for those very interested in the linguistics, there is a word origin for the game of whist. It actually means quiet, attentive, or silent. Why does that word definition matter? We'll see in a moment. Now we're in a position to have player four be the one ready to the deal. They are going to decide to play this five of diamonds here. Why? They kind of want to see what everybody else has on the board. Now, player one is looking at that and thinking of what cards are still out there. For example, we've already seen spade, not spades, diamonds happen once. The two, the three, the six, and the nine are being played. So for player four, they know that the other low card is going to be the four of diamonds. Player one, not knowing this, will decide to play the jack just to see what gets produced. They know that the ace is out there, they know that the king is out there, but they know they have the queen. So they'll see if somebody decides to play that. Well, player two is gonna roll right into that and put out the ace. Now they know that the only card that if they play diamonds can beat it is the king, but they don't know yet what anyone else has. Our big problem's going to be player three. Notice they do not have any spades, which is the trump suit, nor do they have any diamonds. So they're going to play whatever card they can to just throw away. And this is a very important piece of information because this tells player four and player two, the other team, this person doesn't have any spades and doesn't have any diamonds to play. So they can use that to their advantage. So notice that we are all even at two apiece. Everyone's had the opportunity to win once. Now they're gonna make a decision here. Um, they're kind of thinking about it and they decide to go ahead and put the Jack of Hearts out. Player two doesn't have really much of an option here. So they're gonna decide to put out another low card. Now, Player three is gonna still take advantage of what they can do and play the high card, hoping beyond hope that they are going to play a heart. But here is our problem. They don't have any hearts to play, which means it's time to bring out the Trump suit. They're gonna play knowing they can win with the lowest they have. This tells everybody that player four doesn't have any hearts to play. So this is very much an information gathering game, but it does mean that player four wins this trick. So we're gonna put this right here. Now it's gonna be player two again. Now they're really starting to think about it. They're gonna pull out, see they've got the four here. Let's see what they can put out. They remember that this person doesn't have a diamond, nor do they have a spade. So they're gonna put out another bad card to throw away. Now we're looking at diamonds here, so there is a high card to play. They're gonna go ahead and decide to play the king. This puts player one in a bind because they have to play. 
And this means that what they thought was going to be a remaining high card is now used in a loss. So player four is doing pretty well with their information and team B is starting to run away with this a tad. Now we move to player three, who's gonna decide knowing what they've seen so far that they're gonna use a low card here. We'll do the spades here. They have to play on suit. This is a large remaining amount. And notice they know that they have the ace, the king, the queen, and the jack, which means they are in a pretty good informational position to know they're gonna have the high card. So it's just a question of what to play. They're gonna pull out the nine because as long as no one plays a spade, they're going to win. Now they see that this is another high card. They're probably not going to win it since we already know the three has been played. They've kind of given it up and then player two will also throw it away. So player four is having a fairly good hand. Now we make our way all the way back around uh, and they are going to play spade just to see what is out there. Somebody's gonna play the seven. They wanna leave that ace for when they need it. They have nothing to play here, so they are gonna get rid of another card. And this person has a face suited spade. They have to put it out, which means that player four does again win the hand. So some of this is luck. Some of this is information gathering. Some of it is a strategic element. Now we're gonna go over here to we're gonna play the jack, knowing that if somebody has to play a spade already, then they aren't out much. And this person now has no choice but to bring out the spade because they have to play on suit or the spade first. And then we're left with the five, but this technically works out in their favor because again, Team B is starting to really run away with this one. And we're back here. They're gonna play a 10, see if they can get out in front of this. They know that most of the cards have been played to this point, so they're reasonably comfortable with it. They're gonna throw in another low card. Player three is just gonna be a passive advisor here, and they're gonna play another throw away card, try and keep what advantage they've got. So player one will at least nab this one. Uh, player two is gonna play their, they don't know what's left, so they're gonna play another diamond, see if that works out. They don't have one here. So towards the end of the game, you're kind of running out of options and they wanna keep this in their back pocket. And player one has the ability to play their lowest card spade, so that way they can have a little bit of advantage at the end game. So now we're close to the end. We're gonna play a slightly high card. They don't have anything. So they're gonna go ahead and throw this in. They feel pretty comfortable about the way things are going. Uh, but at this point they're throwing things away knowing that player one is going to win that particular round. And then now we'll go ahead and produce the end here where player one will get the last spade. So holding on to a spade at the end, knowing what's been played can sometimes work to your advantage. So this is the end of an initial round. So how do you determine who won? Hold on a second, we'll get to that. So how did this game become so popular? In a time period where card decks were usually fairly expensive due to printing processes, gentlemen were the ones who were playing this game in coffee houses all across London. One in particular, a man by the name of Edmund Hoyle, published a short treatise on the history of whist in 1742. Now, Hoyle, you may be familiar with as a term. If you've ever picked up a rule 
book of card games or board games, they're usually called according to Hoyle or Hoyle's rules. After the publication of the short treatise, we saw the popularity of this game take off. Welcome back. So now that we've seen a full hand played through, we have to determine who wins. And this important part is determining how many rounds and how many what we call tricks were taken by each player. Player three only won one. Player two won two. Player one obviously was the more successful partner here as they pull out five. But player four is doing fairly well with their own five. So notice how even though player four started very well, they had to play defensively towards the end. So now that we have everything apportioned out with the number of decks, we have to count how many tricks were won by each team. So we see that team B has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and team A has one, two, three, four, five, six. So the way the points are tabulated in this game is you're typically playing to five. Some people do play to 15. How do you get that point? Well, it is the number of tricks that you won above six. Someone has to win, there can't be a tie. So this means that team B has scored one point as they acquired one over six. Let's say, for example, though, that player two had won three, leading this to be eight to five. Instead of this being three point differential, you're talking about the number over six. So six, seven, eight. That will be two points scored for team B. So let me show you an example of how rules can play a little differently. I'm gonna talk about bidding. Now, there's something different about this deck that I didn't have last time. There are now two Joker cards. So I'm gonna deal out instead of 13, 12. Why? Glad you asked. Because the Joker card's in there, we can't have an even 13. We need to have something separate. So what we have is something called the Kitty. And this cannot be dealt out with the first four or the last four cards, but can be done at any time. So for example, these have to go naturally, but at any point, I can decide to put some in here, given that I must play six in the middle. I gotta make sure that I keep doing this right. I'll do the last one here and then do everything as normal. So there should be, let's make sure I did this right. One, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 11, 12. And that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 12. Looks like I did it right, but sometimes you mess up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 12, and let's check one last one. And now we've got one, two, three, four, five, six cards in the middle. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get this organized and then I'll show you why these six are in the middle. So each player has 12 cards. The dealer is going to take what we call the kitty and they're gonna actually look at it as a part of now their hand. And what they have to do is decide how they're going to dispose of six cards. So they have to take these and put them in a way that's gonna try and give them some sort of advantage. 
And the reason why is because they are going to try to bid how they're going to win in each hand. And you can take the time to decide how you like. These are all low cards, so it's not the best options here, but what you should have is some combination that puts you in a potential position to win. I'm trying to see if I want to use this eight in some way. Actually, yes, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Take this. So why do we have it organized like this? We come to a point where somebody is going to bid and say, how are they going to win? And by how much? So remember that we had the scoring of anything more than six. So that will be our start. And there will be a couple turns. We're going to put this off to the side. Player one is going to start off as the dealer with one already in hand. So they're going to bid and they're going to determine a couple things. How much are they thinking they're going to win by? Are they going to call a suit, a trump suit? And are the high cards winners or the low cards winners? So this person has almost all pretty high value cards and a joker. They've already won one, so they're going to bid that they're going to win one and they're going to say uptown, which is that the high cards are the ones that are going to win in this with ace being at the top. This person here, they are generally okay with that. Oh, I forgot. Player one also, if they're saying uptown or downtown, has to declare suit. So we're going to say spades because they've got these five here. They don't have the ace, but they've got most of the court cards and a high card. So pretty good estimation and the joker. So this person's going to see they've got a pretty diverse hand, so they don't think they're going to win, but they have a fair amount of the court cards and the joker. So they're going to say to no trump. So they're not going to declare a trump suit, but the high card can still win. And they are thinking they're going to win by two. So they're going to have eight along with their partner. Person over here sees they've got an okay hand, but they don't want to bid, so they pass. And this player is in a similar position, so they don't think that they're going to be able to do anything advantageous, so they're going to pass. So now we're to player one again. They had bid one, now there's two. In order to meet that bid, they would have to win by three rather than one like they originally bid. They've decided, you know what, I'm not going to do that. So what's going to happen is player two is going to have, with no trump suit, the high card, and that they're going to win by two, as in get eight of what we call the books even though player one is starting off with one, so they have to win a lot of these hands. So I'll show you real quickly how it's played. Now, since the dealer is out here and they have made the determination, so they're going to, let's see, they're gonna try and start off strong, try and win a couple quickly. So they play this king of spades. Well, they have the ace. So they're going to play it. And the reason why they can be a little assured with this is they have one of the two jokers. Joker supersedes everything. It is pretty much an automatic win guard. Now, player three sees that a high card's been played. They don't have a joker, but they have to stay, still have to stay on suit. So they're gonna play that two, throw it away. Uh, this player, knows that they're going to win this one, so they're going to play another one of their low cards. And play will continue on around until we get to the end of the game. Let me go ahead and do a run through of this real quick and I'll show you how it looks at the end. So notice the high card was played. 
almost assured that they're going to win this trick, right? Well, here's the problem. The Joker supersedes everything, which means that instead of the high card winning, the Joker wins, putting a little bit more spin on things. So now we've come to the end of a hand. And unfortunately, the bid by player two did not come to fruition. How do we know this? Well, one, two, three, four, five. They bid that they would win by two over six as an eight. They were three short. So we know that because of the failed bid that first off, team A is gonna get the points from what they won over. So they won eight to five, which means that they get two points as it's two over six. Team B is going to lose two points. So they'll be minus two because of what they bid. So. It's a different way to play things with a little bit more strategy, with a little bit more figuring out how it works. So you can play this game in numerous different ways, and it has been played in numerous different ways in many different times. So how do we know so much about this game and its representation of a certain time period? Well, it shows up fairly commonly in literature about the 17th and 18th centuries. The Horatio Hornblower series, Sherlock Holmes, Jules Verne's put it in his books, Leo Tolstoy put it in his books. And remember the linguistic, quiet, attentive, it was usually seen as a card game of strategy, of calm, reserved, analytical, so it was usually used by those who were publishing books like this to emphasize someone's character traits. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to check out some of the other great NPL Universe programming that's out there on our website and on our YouTube page. Next time, we're gonna get into how to play WIST differently, different types of scoring, bidding, and we'll talk about how it evolved into bridge, its modern form. See you next time.